Welcome to the Miami Heat Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Martel Llewellyn. Guys, we're pushing to 4,000 subscribers. If you have not yet subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button, and thank you for all the support. So today's special guest, we have Brother Noomsie here in the building from Sports Time Zone. Make sure you guys go to his channel, hit that subscribe button. Guys, get him to 1,000 subscribers. Make sure that you guys comment under his video, share his videos. Make sure you guys go over there and go support his channel. So how are you doing today, brother? I'm doing great, man. Good to be here on the Heat Zone, man. I, I'm enjoying the energy. Love the vibes. Miami Heat all day. Appreciate you for having me on. Uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, send a special shout out to everybody who supported us. My podcast just reached our 100 subscribers, so a big salute. Appreciate your support. And for all of you who don't know of me and my, and my uh, movement, it's the Sports Time Zone. Only podcast out there giving you two different generation perspective on sports make sure y'all holla at me on ig on the ig page sports time underscore zone let's get it brother make sure you guys go over there and go support his channel so with the jimmy butler contract looming and everything going on where do you stand with that because think about it jimmy butler is going to be 35 years old you know he's really not playing more than 65 games and even when he's playing sometimes you know he's passive he's you know there's only eight shot attempts so where do you stand in terms of giving uh, Jimmy Butler a max contract with his age, with his injury history, and just with us having a high payroll already? With We're already paying Duncan. We're already paying Tyler. We're already paying Bam and Terry. So what is your perspective in terms of Jimmy Butler getting a max contract going forward with the Miami Heat? Yeah, and that's a, that's a real hot topic right now going into the offseason with, uh, with us at Heat Nation and Jimmy and his whole contract situation. But um, I mean, I, I'm a realist. You know, I love my heat. I love Jimmy, but I'm a realist. As you mentioned, Jimmy Butler is he's getting into that that age range where we got to start looking at how many more years does he have left at this level? Uh, we have noticed that over the last couple of years, his production uh, during the regular season hasn't been what it was in years of past. This last season in particular, where he missed a number of games. Uh, he seemed a bit hesitant when he gets into the lane to, to just go up and, and make plays. It seemed as though he passed out of a lot of easy layups when he was right there at the bucket. Uh, and also, Jimmy himself knows that in order for him to have adequate help around him, we have to be able to pay the help. And if he's asking for a, you know a, a max deal or if he's trying to max out what he can get from us, he has to also understand that that's going to handcuff us and limit us into who we can go out there to bring in uh, to help him out. So in one breath, you know, Jimmy says that he's all about winning. He wants to win. Winning a championship at this stage of his career is his top priority, according to what he says. But in the second breath, he also, you know, has his agent putting out, you know, headlines that he's about to try to break the bank, you know, and it can't be both things. It can't be both ways. So uh, the way I see it in a perfect world, uh, Jimmy will stand down a bit on his contract expectations so that Pat Riley can have you know, some something to maneuver and try to bring in some help. But at, to your point, we're already into the luxury cap uh, area as far as salary. We're over, the, we're over the salary cap. And at the same time, we're also seen as not having viable assets for trades. I don't know how that's even possible. How can you be over the salary cap, but at the same time, you don't have assets so that, like you said, there's a lot of contracts I think that we overpaid on and certain players that are not playing up to the potential of the contract that they earned. And I would hate to see us do that same thing with Jimmy and handcuff us. So uh, I would like to see Jimmy stand down and take a little less money than what his agent is saying so that we can have a little bit of leverage, uh, leverage to try to negotiate. But as far as giving him that kind of deal that he's looking for, I don't see that as being smart at this stage of his career because uh, then we're on the books to owing him that much money. We gave Duncan Robinson uh, 90 million. We gave Tyler Hero upwards of 100. So I don't know that throwing a bunch of money at Jimmy at this stage of his career is really going to do us do us uh, well going forward, especially in the next couple of years when he's about to be 34, 35 and 36 years old. He wants us to pay him like he's a prime, like he's in his prime. And, and I just don't see that. So if it comes down to it and it's like, Jimmy, either I get this bag or I walk, I'm quite sure with that money that we save, 
would be able to go out there and make a push for someone uh, that's comparable. But I don't see throwing that kind of money at Jimmy at this stage of his career. And I love Jimmy, but I, I, I'm not a big fan of that kind of contract for someone in that age. So do you believe in paying players for what they did in the past? Because I know a lot of Miami Heat fans say, yeah, well, you know, the playoff runs were amazing and we don't want to make the same mistake that we did with D-Wade when I think D-Wade is kind of a totally different situation. D-Wade was drafted to this team. So do you believe in paying players like Jimmy Butler for what they did in the past? Because I think also, too, that's kind of how he's going to have to look at it. He's probably going to tell Pat, well, listen, look what I've done. I've been able to, you know, drag these teams to the NBA Finals, the Eastern Conference Finals, and he really hasn't always had the best help. So do you believe in paying players just for what they did in the past alone? Well, as you mentioned, Dwayne Wade, D-Wade was a, was a unique case. We drafted D-Wade. He, he brought, he recruited LeBron. He recruited Chris Bosh. I mean, make no mistakes about it. That wasn't Pat Riley. That was D-Wade who, who did that recruiting effort. So in many ways, D-Wade is responsible for those championships in more ways than one, on and off the court. So with D-Wade, aside from that, just looking at in a vacuum paying players for what they did in the past. I'm a loyalist. I believe that, you know, if players take pay cuts and they do things necessary to bring other players and other talent in, then you should take care of them on the back end. I, I get that. But in this case of Jimmy, uh, I haven't seen Jimmy taking any pay cuts. I haven't seen Jimmy doing heavy recruiting to bring talent into Miami so based on his value of what he's uh, brought to the team, yes, he's taken us to the playoffs. Yes, he's gotten us into the finals. But in, in the finals, I believe uh, what against the Lakers, we won, what, two games in that in that final series. And then against Denver, we won one. So out of all of those uh, finals games, we were like three and eight in the finals with Jimmy. And I... <laughs> But now I see that as being a reason to give Jimmy that type of money. So but now I go out and get it. I don't think that that warrants us paying him for his prior accomplishment. This is a what have you done for me lately league. And we've had a drought now of make of winning a championship. It's been seems like forever since LeBron and, and, and Bosch and those boys were here. So, no, um, I don't believe in that for Jimmy. It would be a different story if we would have won one of those championships under Jimmy or, you know, he brought in somebody, you know, spectacular enough to say, OK, you know what? We're a contender uh, every single year going forward. But he hasn't done that. So I don't see Jimmy as being warranted for being paid for his past accomplishments. He should be paid based on the current his current value and the current environment of the league now. All right, so then when you look across the NBA, like I know a lot of Miami Heat fans, and there's a bunch of rumors about the Miami Heat being interested in Donovan Mitchell or Lori Marketing. Now, what's your ideal, you know, fit on this roster going forward? Because, you know, this Miami Heat team, we like scoring, we like rebounding, you know, we lack size. Like I know that the draft is around the corner, but since we're linked to Donovan Mitchell and Lori Marketing, and, you know, I think that my plan B, if we don't get Donovan Mitchell, is definitely DeJounte Murray or maybe even a Trey Young. So how can this Miami Heat team just improve their roster by going after one of these stars? And are you willing to go all in in terms of maybe even have to give up Tyler Jovich and Jaime Hawkins Jr., if that's what it takes? Yeah, um, and you touched on a great point. Uh, one of our main needs and necessities is scoring. Uh, it was discussed at nauseum by around the league, the commentators, ESPN, fans, of saying how difficult it, it was for us to manufacture points, especially when we needed a bucket, when we need a definite bucket or it's crunch time and we're down by six and the game is still in range. All we need is to string together a few possessions where we get a few buckets in a row. We struggled in that area. We struggled dramatically to manufacture points, and that's no secret about that. So scoring is definitely something that we need to address. Uh, now, to answer your question, it can go two ways. If we're going to keep Jimmy, if Jimmy is indeed going to stay and he's going to be satisfied with the contract that we give him, then we absolutely have to focus on getting someone that can take the scoring load off of Jimmy. At this stage of his career, he's not at the stage where he can carry a team 
and be the only effective scorer on a roster. That's he's way beyond that stage of his career. I mean, I know a lot of our Heat Nation don't want to hear that, but I'm gonna keep it a buck. All right. This ain't the Jimmy that came in here years ago. This ain't the Jimmy from the bubble. This ain't even playoff Jimmy that eliminated the Milwaukee Bucks. All right. We got to be real with ourselves and look in the mirror and see Jimmy for who he is right now. And honestly, I think we've seen the best of him. So with that being said, a Donovan Mitchell would be an excellent compliment for him if it does require going all in to, to give up the Tyler Heroes and the and the and the Jaime Jaquez Juniors and whoever else may be necessary. I mean, without clearing the entire decks for him, I get that. But if we need to move hell and high water to get Jimmy some help to maximize our chances to getting to the NBA finals and winning it, then I, I say we do need to be all in. Uh, a second caveat to that is Bam. We know Bam is an above average defender, but Bam, let's keep it a buck there too. Bam is not a go-to scorer. And in many instances, when Jimmy was out or Tyler was struggling or Duncan can't buy a bucket or Scary Terry was still trying to get acclimated into the system, I noticed Bam trying to force offense bam taking threes bam taking mid-range shots bam trying to be a perimeter uh, perimeter offensive player which he's not so if we do get that score if we are able to bring a donovan mitchell in if we are able to bring in a trey young or even a Lori marketing who can play center and move bam over to a power forward position where he can focus more on defense which is his strength then that'll be a huge plus and a huge shot in the arm for us as well but definitely a big move has to be made in some area, some aspect, not the little small deals here and there, not the Kyle Lowry moves, not the, you know, uh, the little small uh, knickknack moves that Pat Riley likes to do. Pat Riley likes to shop at the at the flea market. <laughs> we need to go to the mall. <laughs> we need to go to Aventura Mall and go in there in one of them designer stores and come out with a chinchilla or something. But I get it. Pat Riley's been able to get us far with flea market quality. But at this stage now, we definitely need to bring in a big whale. So, yes, I, to answer your question, yes, I definitely think that we should go all in at this point. It's the downside of Jimmy's career. Uh, Pat Riley's also on the downside of his career. We're in a, a drought as far as winning a championship. And we struggle to score points we're trending in the wrong direction we go from the finals to eliminate it in the first round that's the wrong direction we need to be going in the other direction so so yes i would be all in right now got you and right before we close just an overall look at the roster because like i know a lot of people say oh well you know you have to be able to um you know get a start get a start get a start but i just think that we can just make you know marginal moves in terms of like what the Mavericks did look at like they got PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford so maybe you don't always need a star but what about just you know good role players that complement your best player what do you think about that as well well, well yeah little, I, because Bam is doing everything like a Kyle Kuzma type you see what I'm saying yeah. you know something to just help Bam out about because by the time Bam gets to the playoffs he's exhausted he has to do everything or maybe like a Colin Sexton as a backup point guard you know, maybe just some of those modifications that can help Jimmy, Bam, and Tyler and complement our best players. Yeah, a small tweak here and there could be the answer, which I thought that's what we were doing when we brought Terry Rozier in. I honestly, in my heart of hearts, felt like, okay, well, bringing Terry in, that's the small move that we might need. That'll be just enough. He can provide scoring. He can run the offense. He plays great defense. And he's a up-tempo player, which are things that, He's everything Kyle Lowry was not. So I actually thought that, and with Kyle Lowry, we made it all the way to the final. So I was looking at it in a vacuum and saying, okay, well, with that kind of move, things would move the needle. But there's still holes. We still have holes. Uh, but you know why, though? You know why, though? Because Terry and Tyler aren't the best defenders. And the problem is, and I think if you're realizing and watching the NBA, when you look across the NBA, the starting fives, they all complement each other, and there's no weaknesses. Of course, you know, you might have one big man that might not be able to move laterally or quickly, but think about it. 
And this is what a lot of these Miami Heat fans don't understand and what the Miami Heat organization doesn't understand. The fact that we had Tyler and Terry where they're not the best defenders. So you have two negative defenders already in your backcourt. Mm -hmm. Then you have a power forward who's drastically undersized and undrafted in Haywood Heisman or Caleb Martin. So technically, you're already starting the game off with three negatives going into a game. And like I said, as you climb and get up further to each round, the teams get better. And they have less weaknesses. Like, look at the Boston Celtics. Yeah. All five of those guys can guard anybody pretty much. You know what I'm well, saying? They, you know, what I mean? there's no weakness on their team. They have size. They have scoring. They have defense. You see what I'm saying? And like, when you look across the NBA, the Denver Nuggets, like, there's yeah. no weaknesses on their teams. This Miami Heat team, they're making the wrong moves in certain aspects. So what I mean by that is, yeah, how are you? Terry's good, but if I was them, I would have got Dejounte Murray to put next to Tyler Hero. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I don't know how realistic uh, getting Dejounte would have been last season. Two first but... round picks, he was on the board. I mean, I don't know, re like you know, we don't really know how how available they really are. You know, right. I mean, we're not in those circles, but they were asking for two first round picks, and if it, that's me, I go all in on that because he fits the Bam at a bio timeline. He fits the Jimmy timeline. Right. He can play next to Hero as a good defensive guard. Those right. are the different things that we could look at, you know? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that as DeJounte being a bigger, but there's several teams. The Lakers were in talks of, you know, trying to snag DeJounte. You know, I, I heard talks of, you know, even Phoenix, you know, trying to make a move to to move one of their big three for a DeJounte type of a player because they're void of any offensive playmaker or play caller there. So, yeah, DeJounte would be a hot commodity. But, you know, it's, you know, back to your, your, your initial question, uh, as far as, you know, small moves here and there, we definitely at this point, we've got to figure out what we're going to do with Tyler. Uh, I don't know that we're going to if we do decide to move Tyler unless we package him a la what you were just mentioning for uh, a Donovan Mitchell. We're not really I don't think we're going to get the value back that we feel he's worth. You know, I don't think uh, Pat Riley's value on Tyler is seen the same around the league. Uh, but we have to figure out what we're going to do there and in some type of way, we figure out how to get more size. This the, the fix could possibly just be to get someone who can play center. It may not be an athletic big man or someone who's going to get you a double double, but just a defensive presence to where Bam can now roam and utilize his strengths more. Just yep. that small change right there alone could be the difference. Uh, I look another thing. I looked around the league when these playoffs started and almost every team in the postseason this year had at least one seven foot, one legit seven footer in their starting lineup around the, you look at to a team in the, in the playoffs this year with the exception of maybe, uh, maybe Dallas. Cause I don't know if Gafford or lively are really seven, but they're like six eleven. So they're yeah. close enough. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like pretty much. So what, what that says to me with all of these teams going back to the conventional big man and the conventional center, that the small ball era may have passed us. The small ball era may be over. Look at Golden State and where they're trending versus where they were when the small ball era was on and popping. Now, second chance points and third chance points win championships that's just plain and simple rebounding the team, the team who gets the most offensive rebounds nine times out of ten they move on you saw what dallas did in that last series against minnesota and how they were relentless on the glass they were relentless on the glass minnesota prior to being eliminated by dallas they were relentless on the offensive glass second and third chance points also are what killed us that's also our weakness. When you look at the way that we were eliminated by Boston, I mean, Boston was just a better team. Yes, true enough. But in games prior, that playing game against Philly, the, the where we had an opportunity to lock in the seventh seed, we were out rebounded tremendously in that game. Like we didn't, I don't even think we were within shouting range of, of rebounding versus what Philadelphia did. So I looked at that. And I say to myself, OK, another possession here, another possession there. That turns the tide of a game. 
So I really think that that's something that we need to address is is our size deficiency. I don't know that it's something that Spo is going to want to tweak because it seems like he is since he's come into the league, he's been really adamant about playing small ball since he became the coach. But that only works when you have superstar talent on your team, a la LeBron James and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh and, you know, guys like that. They can make up for any size deficiency. But when you're playing with flea market quality, you at least got to have a seven footer, someone who can guarantee you at least a a few offensive rebounds, second chance points, third chance points. So those are the things that I think we need. And it could just be a marginal big man. We don't need a superstar. We don't need a Joel Embiid or, you know, a, a Porzingis or a Joker, just somebody, a Gafford or a Lively. Or, uh, you know, someone complimentary to Bam who can occupy space in the lane and allow our other players to do what their specialty is instead of having people do more than what their skill set allows them to do. Absolutely. Well, my brother, thank you once again, guys. Make sure you guys go to Sports Time Zone. Yes. Run up the likes. Subscribe to his channel. He's a Heat fan. And, guys, we're all Heat fans here. If you're a Heat fan, there's no reason why you're not subscribed to his channel make sure you guys go over there follow his nba content there you go there you go make sure you guys subscribe to his channel comment yeah. share and go over there and go show him some love appreciate so that my brother. Up, brother appreciate that and before we go i gotta get this from you because i just did an episode on my show last week and i got everybody's prediction so i need to know from you who do you got in the finals and how many games and why let me go Mavs in six, and I'll say that because a lot of people are sleeping on the Dallas Mavericks. Don't get me wrong. I think the Boston Celtics, they are a juggernaut. They have one of the best starting lineups on paper. But to be honest, this Mavs team, it reminds me of the 2011 Mavs. So what I mean by that is, yes, okay, like in terms of, yeah, Kyrie and Luka are great. And same thing, Dirk was great. But people are forgetting about the role players on that team. And I think that, you know, the additions of P.J. and the additions of Daniel Gafford, they're playing some of the best basketball. Remember, what were they? They were closer to the end of the Western Conference in the standings. And then they started playing incredible basketball and yeah. turned it around. They were close to being a play-in team. They were yes. they were kind of flirting with that play-in team. Uh, so, so, yeah, so you like Dallas in six. I also have... Dallas Mavericks in six for similar reasons. Their role players, uh, their their offensive rebound relentlessness, and also want to see what Chris Stapp's Porzingis brings. If Porzingis is not near a hundred percent, or if he's not the Porzingis that we're accustomed to seeing, then I think this probably could end shorter than than six games. I'm taking nothing away from Tatum, nothing away from Jalen Brown, but I, I just like Dallas. Their star power is there. Their role players are there. They're playing much better. We see how they just steamrolled the best defense in the NBA and made it look easy. I just think they're they're it's their year. They're the team of destiny this year. So yeah, I like Dallas Mavericks in six. Just wanted to get your take on that. But um, salute to everybody out there in the Miami Heat zone, and I appreciate you for having me again, brother. Absolutely, thank you, my brother. All right, we'll catch you on the flip side. See you on the time zone.